Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Transmit Festival. Uh, this festival is an art and science festival that plans to be here uh, with live audience. And uh, but COVID had other plans for us, but we still hold on and we'll have a fascinating festival of art and science collaborations around the world. And uh, today with me are uh, Caroline Maxwell, an artist, Gilly Taguri Cohen, an artist, Just Crystals, and soon Noah uh, will join us, Noah Kumana Scanner, um, a paper preservator. And today we will speak about an enigma starting with a painting. So I'll just introduce myself. My name is Sam Israel. I am one of the curators of the Transmit Festival, along with Sharona Florstein and Tomer Polanski. And I'm also the curator of a new exciting museum, the Federal Museum of Art and Nanoscience, where artists and scientists are collaborating and forming new languages um, in their collaborations. So it all started um, several years ago in a different exhibition when Caroline uh, painted a painting made out of uh, salt water. And uh, this painting was dry and beautiful and was hanging on the walls of the gallery. Uh, but then one early morning, I got an urgent call from the gallery sitter telling me that the paintings are dripping from the walls. So Caroline, um, can you start telling us about your painting? Well, sure. Um, I started painting um, on this project. I think it was about 2006 when I first did it. I, I had already had an interest in working with, um, with materials that are very specific to certain places where I would collect the materials, natural materials usually. And I wanted to work with these sort of unusual and really for me, it was um, sort of living materials. Um, I felt like they were sort of my collaborators. And so I had collected a sample of salt water from the Great Salt Lake in Utah. And soon after that, I had a friend bring me a bottle of water from the Dead Sea in Israel. And I had these two salt waters that I thought were really interesting because of their specific sort of origins. And, um, and so I decided to start making paintings with these where I would just paint on pieces of black paper and other surfaces. And then when it dried and the water evaporated, what was left on the surface were just little salt crystals. So I started doing a series of paintings that I called salt animals, where I started painting these little animals. They were sort of like deers or maybe gazelles or just little four-legged delicate little herds of animals. And I would paint them very quickly with a brush on black paper and then let them sit in the sun. I think it was a hot time of the year, it was very dry. So the water evaporated and these beautiful salt crystal patterns were left on the paper. And we discovered immediately that the water from the Great Salt Lake had a very different crystal pattern than the water from the Dead Sea, completely different. And they behaved very differently too in the way that they took more time to dry for the dead sea water. And so, so I had all of these paintings and I created more and more and more pages and they sort of expanded and filled all of these sheets of black paper until it looked like a big galaxy of little sparkling salt animals on black paper. And I thought that was it. I thought that was the end of the piece. I hung it on the wall for a show. And then the story continued after I gave some of these panels to Tal many years later, where she brought them to this museum um, to, to display them in Israel, which we then learned that the humidity and the air made them behave very differently. Um, apparently the, the salt crystals would absorb moisture from the air if it was a humid day and they would reliquify. It was this sudden um, surprise that we all discovered. And I realized at that point that these artworks were very much alive. They would change, they had moods. And, um, and so the collaboration began. We wanted to discover more about these and understand about um, everything from the different crystallization patterns to the behavior of the salt water. And, and I think that's, that's pretty much it. I think we'll let these people tell the rest of the story. <laughs> Actually, it's a new kind of approach. It's the first time that um, usually artists and scientists are coming into the museum together to collaborate. But then a painting came to collaborate. Caroline was far away. And the painting at the beginning collaborated with um, Gilly and Noah. 
and uh, slowly, slowly, we we understood we have to have Caroline with us in order to reveal the whole enigma. Um, so, uh, if we can share the the short film now, we will share it. When I first did this series, I did it on a really hot, dry summer day. The process of painting is just basically dipping the brush into the salt water and painting on the black paper. And I just kind of improvise it as I go. I paint these little animals. אני ראיתי כאילו היא ביצעה ניסוי, בלי שהיא ידעה אומנית, היא מבחינתה רק צעירה במלח, כאילו היא השתמשה באיזה משהו מהטבע, והיא בעצם לא הבינה שיש פה ניסוי שלם ש... שאפשר להיכנס לתוכו. And when I first started doing these animal paintings, I liked the fact that the water would just flow from one animal into the next one. Dead sea water is a lot more difficult to work with than the Great Salt Lake water. כשהעבודות הגיעו אלינו בתקופה האחרונה, הדימויים של החיות שהיא צירה במלח נראו מאוד שונה ממה שכנראה נראו כשהיא יצרה אותן. זה גם קרה בצורה לא אחידה, וזה אחת התופעות המעניינות. סוג אחד של איילים שינה את הצבע שלו והפך להיות איילים אדומים, וקראנו להם החיות האדומות, והוא הפך להיות שטוח, וסוג אחר הפך להיות לבן. ונשארו כבישים. בעצם השאלה הייתה שאלה גדולה. מה קרה פה? למה זה שינה את הצבע שלו? הסיבה שזה מעניין אותנו להיכנס לכל זה היא גם אקדמית כמין מחקר, אם רואים את התהליך הציור כאיזושהי עבודת מחקר, כי נלקח פה מלח משני מקורות שונים, ו- ומאותו רגע שהוא שם על הנייר הוא עבר את אותם תנאים, אבל התוצאה היא שונה. עוד שכבה ועוד שכבה, ואני מרגישה כרגע בעיקר צופה מהצד ש... שמשלבת בין שני הדברים ושואלת שאלות. מול הכניסה אל תוך ה... אצלי זה ברמה האטומית ממש, המבנה האטומי של הכבישים הקטנים שמרכיבים. לעומק תהליך העבודה של האומן, בחירת הצבעים, בחירת המצע, So, hi. Hi, hi. Uh, okay, my name is Didi, and, uh, and I'm in charge of the X-ray laboratory in the Nano Center in Barilani University. And two years ago, Tal came into my lab and she told me that she has a piece of art that uh, she, she wants, she, that something happened to it, and she wants to understand what, to figure out what happened to the, to the art. And first of all, I was skeptic. I didn't know how can I can contribute in, to understand what happened. Uh, but then Pal, Pal was so enthusiastic about this project and I really want to take part of the Nano Art Museum that just started in the bar Ilan. So I said yes. And I thought how, how I'm related to this, but as Caroline uh, already mentioned, she used two different of, uh, kind of uh, solution from two different, uh, uh, two different lakes of salt lakes. And, and as we know, mineral and salt are crystal, and I am researching crystal for many years, so we, ta- we, we take the challenge and we look to, on it as a mystery. Uh, so let's look on the evidence. On the original one, we can say, on the original art, we can see two different kind of uh, morphology or uh, shapes. This elongated crystal, and this is like more like lots one. And after 12 years, what we can see, it's, some of them become red, they even lose, uh, lose their shape. Um, some of them stay the same color. The, the red one beca- becomes flat. And if we look on the other side, we can see this wavy, um, wavy structure of the, the paper. We can see some red, red color and also some white artifacts and blobs like in the paper. 
So one of the approach is to do, to solve such a question, why it becomes red, is, is to do in reverse engineering. Um, so before doing reverse engineering, I'm, I'm mostly that I'm doing a literature survey, and that's what I did. I, I saw this article, and I saw that there is bacterium, bacteria that, which calls allobacteria, that uh, lives in a salty uh, environment and makes the salt red. So I called Tal, I remember, and no, I told them, that we, we have the solution. This is red because of this allobacteria, but then we have to prove it. So luckily me, I'm working in the Nano Center, and I have a, a lot of colleagues and friends. So with the help of Dr. Avid Jaikovs, I go to the electron microscope, to the optics microscope uh, lab, and we took this image of the red animal. And when we zoom in, we could see this cellulose. So for me, it was the first time I saw a, a paper in an electron microscope, in, in optic microscope. So what we can see here is the, the fiber of the paper and some blobs, white blobs, which looks like crystals embedded in the paper. But in order to prove that we have an, a microorganism, we can use a, a fluorescence light to emit light on the, on the paper and to see if we get a back fluorescence from the microorganism. But what we get is this, this amount, very weak signal, which can, could not explain the, 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 it's not an evidence that this is really for microbiologic. It was like the signal, like a noise. But we didn't give up, and we go even further look with an electron microscope, which can give us even large uh, scale. It's like nano, nano scale. And we saw this particle. This one looks like the micro, the, the allobacteria that I saw in the paper. So going to a large view, we see that this is just one particle. It's not a colloid of, of um, allobacteria. We can see just one part. And most of the part, we can see these uh, fibers, which are cellulose fibers of the paper, and we see the small crystals. So we understand that we cannot say that this is from the allobacteria. But uh, when consulted with Noah, she, she suggested maybe the color is from the, the, the paper. The paper looks black, but when we put it in a, in a water, we saw red water coming out of the paper. So now we have to, to do something to understand what are the materials that, that on the paper. So I'm in charge of the x-ray. The x-ray uh, uh, using x-ray photons which bombs the, the sample, and we get a, we get a signature of the, of the material. Between the, the, the bombs, the, the photons bombs the, the, the material atoms, it interacts with them, and from the scattered uh, signal, we can learn on, on the uh, structure of the material. And I sampled three different um, places on the, on the artwork, just the black paper, the red animal, and the white animal. And what we got is that we have three, three signatures. We saw the cellulose, this is the, the cellulose, is the, the fibers, the, the paper. We saw that there is a mineral called gypsum or calcium powder or plaster that, you know, maybe you, you know it. And we saw that we have a, a table salt, a sodium chloride, halite, which is also very known. So going back again, we want to see the image. So we go, go back to the electron uh, microscope uh, uh, with the help of uh, Dr. Ayelet Atkins, she's another colleague of me. And we saw this huge, um, this huge uh, salt crystal. And when we zoom in, we can see these nice flowers of gypsum that grow on the top of the facet of the mineral. This, this image we got, and we saw this one, and even this one. This one is, looks like, uh, um, I said, I said that like, like a, an art made by the, the, by, the, by the nature or by Caroline. This is really an art. But unfortunately, we didn't saw these nice flowers on the, on the red animal. When we, when we took the red animal to the microscope, we saw this picture, we see this cellulose, and we saw like broken crystal embedded in the, in the, in the, in the cellulose fibers. We don't see these flowers. So we, this is already a clue that something happened to the cellulose, because we have cellulose in both, both um, animals. So going back, we, need, we understand that we need to reproduce the, the, the work. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, this was, 
I just want to ask that what we were missing was gypsum between the two uh, images, not uh, what went missing is the gypsum in the red animals, right? Or yeah. We had gypsum, but the, the shape of the gypsum looks different. It looks like okay. broken or smaller, but we, we, we understand that we are stuck in the, in, the, in the research. We cannot explain why it's turned red. We, have, we, under, we understand that something happened, and we understand that the red color is coming from the paper, but why just one kind of the animals are getting are turned to red and one doesn't, didn't? So we, we decided to go back and do the, the experiment again. Lucky us, Caroline saved the solution, the original one. And she, she sent us the, the solution. It was like a gold in my lab. And she did it, she tried to do the, the work again. And she, I think this is the, the work that, this is the new one that made in, in the previous year, right? So, yes, I was going to add that uh, at the stage that what we did is actually a, a mock-up using uh, but using Caroline's original art um, artist materials which is the two different uh, salt lake and uh, salt lake waters and in conservation we we are very used to to preparing mock-ups for reasons of um, being able to anticipate a deterioration process or to be able to choose uh, a treatment uh, a, treatment procedure that we want to carry out. We like conducting these on mock-ups rather than on the, the real object. Um, but it's not very often that we get the, the actual, the whole set of working of artist materials that, like we had in this, uh, in this particular project. And this was very, very nice because Gilly, uh, she will show you the slides now, but she was able to, um, at one side, uh, Caroline was preparing her own new samples of the, the same work process. And Gilly was doing the same thing in Israel. And we could, this way, we could continuing the investigation. Okay, so, uh, so as you said, I, I, this is the, the, I try to do it in the lab. I wait to a very odd day and maybe wet, and I put some drops on the, on the dishes battery outside the, the nano center um, building. And after a couple of, couple of minutes, I, I got this crystal and, and they really, I got, now I can know, I can distinguish between the two different uh, morphology and I can say which one is from the Great Salt Lake and which one is from the Dead Sea. And this is a closer look of this. Uh, rectangle uh, sodium chloride that we know and this one I wanted to measure them. I met I, I did this uh, uh, this experiment like evaporation from a solution this is what it's called in chemistry um, I made it also on the paper on the same paper that uh, Caroline used uh, so I saw this nice um, elongated crystal and I wanted to put it in the XRD to get a, a new signature to see what it is. So I got to bring myself a coffee and when I came back to the lab I saw this wet uh, weight area. All the, all the crystal disappear and I understood that I have to do it again and, and do it very quickly uh, to go back without coffee just to put it and to save it in a wet, in a dry uh, environment and to measure it. And when I put it in the XRD, again, we got the signature. Okay, it was obvious that we have a sodium chloride, NaCl, but we have a new material that we didn't see until this point, which calls caroline, car car carmelite. Carmelite, when I googled it up, I found it that it's a very, one of the unique characterized of this material is that it's absorb water from the, the, air, the surrounding air and dissolve in it and become and form again a, a solution. So um, I called the, of course, again, no, I'm talent. I told her that, yeah, now we have, we got it. We, I think we have a solution. So we want to verify the result. So we took the, the original solution to another analytical, um, analytical method uh, for detect element in the solution. And we found out that in the Dead Sea is really rich in magnesium and potassium. This explains why carmelite was formed in the beginning. 
Um, so again, we did, uh, we took some, some image and we saw this nice uh, sodium chloride uh, crystals and on the top of it, we can, we can see um, gypsum and we can see the cellulose. And the most important thing that we saw the, 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 the carnalite um, structure on the top and we, could, we can do the correlation that we have, we can be sure that this is carnalite. Uh, so to summarize all this and going back to the, the original work, we, we can distinguish in the original work in two different uh, morphology. One, are, we know this one, we already know that this is made from the solution from the Dead Sea, and this one are made from the Great Salt Lake. The, okay, the, the, the animals that are made from the solution from the Dead Sea is rich for, in magnesium and potassium, and this is why carnalite is formed. The carnalite dissolve very quickly. It's re really sensitive to air and it absorbs very, um, very quickly water and dissolve in it. And not just it dissolve in it, we saw some of the water go, go, got out of the, of the paper. This is why it disappeared, because it's dissolving on it and maybe go out of the water. We saw this, uh, the gypsum, we think also dissolve in the water. This is why we saw it so broken, embedded in the cellulose. And the reason why this one turns red, we think that the, the pigment or the dye from the, the red, from the red dye or the red pigment from the paper um, color the, 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 the gypsum that maybe uh, stay on the paper. And uh, on the other side, we have this animal that didn't, almost didn't change their shape um, these are made from uh, the Great Salt Lake, which have mostly sodium chloride and, and gypsum. They are not sensitive to air, so they keep their shape mostly. And I think this is uh, what we think. Thank you. So, so basically, uh, after revealing all this, Caroline was pa painting a painting, but then after all, we have almost a sculpture embedded into the fibers of the paper. We have gypsum uh, present here, and uh, we have other materials and substances that are present. And uh, I have to tell the other side of uh, experiencing this enigma where I would go up the stairs of the Nano Institute and meet other researchers they were all in this mystery, trying to uh, find out what it is. And they were assisting Gilly with all kinds of um, um, knowledge and uh, machines. And it was fascinating. And it's still, actually all the works in the museum are works in process. And I think they will always stay in process in, in some way. And um, each day we have another revelation and um, next to the work there is um, a folder with all the emails in between us and all the scans so um, it's, it's kind of an ongoing conversation and um, it's, it's fascinating. I wonder Noah from your point of view with those materials how often as a preservator, you, you need those materials. Well, um, these, these were definitely um, unusual and uh, not, not a standard artist materials. Uh, salt is, is a big uh, issue in, in conservation in general because salt is present in archeolo archeological objects in walls and a lot of conservators deal with these problems, but it's rarely uh, used as an artist materials per se. And I'm an art, uh, art on paper conservator. So I really um, uh, have to deal with it uh, very little. And in this uh, arrangement, it really has never come, never come across uh, these issues. I do um, uh, treat it though as, as an, object uh, that is still 
in process and it will probably continue. I, I understand that it's some it's an object that will continue to to change and alter. And as much as we will try to um, find as a conservator, we always aim to um, stabilize the artworks uh, as much as we can. Uh, but sometimes, and this is not the only case, uh, the artwork continues to alter and, uh, and regardless of the conditions that we try to create to preserve it. And, uh, but it's still interesting to follow uh, this process to understand why it changes in a certain way and, um, and to research uh, and, and maybe understand if we can control it. And we are trying at the Nano Museum to create a, a vitrine that that will um, give a, a, a cl climatic environment that will uh, maybe slow down this process. However, as you mentioned, it changes uh, uh, and it hasn't really stopped changing. <laughs> it's an interesting and, point because the role of the museum, one of the roles of the museum is uh, to preserve and to keep and here, um, keeping is um, sometimes letting it change in our sense, because uh, it's kind of a live piece. And um, I think that Caroline, you are uh, relaying to your work often as something that is not final. And you work with other interesting materials. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, yeah. So. Um, so yeah, I, I do like materials that are um, that are a bit unruly and unpredictable because I do I do like working with things that that have, feel like they have a bit of a life you know beyond me and beyond my control. So so with this, even with the salt, you know, working with a material that is essentially destroying the piece over time, to me, this the fact that it brings people together around this project, and now I feel like the art piece includes all of you know, my collaborators here in this group. And I feel like now we are really part of the artwork essentially because we, you know, we have to be there. We have to be there working with it to, you know, to keep it alive really. And to keep, you know, while it's changing, obviously we putting on a lot of effort, but, um, but I do like that. I like the fact that it brings people together and we have to be active and interacting with it in order to make the work happen now. So, so that's very important to me, but, um, but yeah, Tal was saying, I, I do work with other materials as well. I'm always curious and testing things out. Um, so, so recently I've been doing pieces where I've made my own ink from walnuts that I've collected here in California from some endangered species of walnut trees that we have. And now I'm making my own ink and experimenting and doing paintings with these and working with materials from the trees. And so, you know, so again, I don't know what's going to happen with them, what the, the long-term lifespan is going to be. I look forward to the paper conservators and, <laughs> and scientists who can tell me what's happening on a different level. But, um, but yeah, yeah, I think that the materials are always so important, you know, to work with, um, you know, for, for them to, to be just as active <laughs> and informing the meaning behind the work as I am. So, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. It's been a it's been a very interesting uh, collaboration and uh, still ongoing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we, we built uh, after all this conversation, we built a special print for the work, and I wonder how will it work uh, now? How will it change? And uh, we still have an access to it, and uh, we have three way of uh, retrying to make this artwork or understand this artwork. And I think this conversation is um, an ongoing one. And this is what is unique and interesting about it. Um, just a short question as we have only one minute. Um, can, um, in a really short sentence, uh, uh, all of you can tell how did it change the way that you think now, proceed in your own field? Should I start? Yes. I'm just, uh, I, I'm 
I, I think the, the facility is the whole concept of the nano museum and the idea of uh, uh, you being there as an artist and a curator and right next door or in the same building with all these scientific uh, facilities has a great potential and I'm eager to, <laughs> uh, to, to see what else uh, comes out of this, uh, this setup. Uh, and and of course, very curious, continuing to to see what happens with Caroline's work and uh, this particular one and what comes next. And you, Caroline? Well, yeah, thank you. Um, I I think that for me, it really has just reinforced to me how it's really important as an artist to to listen to your materials and to understand that they speak in so many different ways, and it's not just you know, a visual sort of language that materials sort of can speak in, in ways that they exist, you know, that for scientists, they, they're, you know, they're hearing these materials in many different ways and experiencing them in so many different ways. So, so as an artist, if we can work with all of those different, you know, ways of the materials behaving and expressing themselves, I think that that's going to be really interesting. And so it also requires a little bit of patience and waiting and sort of being in this position of not knowing what's going to happen and, you know, and working with that, you know, the artists who work with time in a way, this is a way that materials sort of exist and express themselves in time. So, so I, to me, that's just very exciting. So, so thank you. I'm, I'm glad to have these collaborators on board with me. Thank you. In, in continuing to what Noah not just said, um, I should uh, build a presentation of a of company that I'm working with to, to, that we can tell. So in the first time I thought that I can put an art museum in my work because it's really, we can characterize the XLD art, with art museum. And it was very nice to collaborate. You have like different thinking uh, and different uh, looking way of looking on things, so it was amazing. <laughs> so um, I wanted to thank to you uh, all of you, um, and I also wanted to thank uh, the Steiner Museum of uh, of Nature uh, for hosting us today. And um, in the Federal Museum of Nanoscience and Art, and the Federal Family for just supporting this ongoing research. And we all hope that one day soon we will all meet together in the actual <laughs> present and not over the screens. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, audience. Thank you.